Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham and this is my dear friend, Ty Frank, and my sort of friend, Dan Nowak, big friend of the show. Good to have you, buddy. <laughs> Just giving you a hard time. I would say acquaintance. Acquaintance. Yeah, Dan's yeah. more of an acquaintance you know, yeah, than yeah. anything else. First yeah. time, long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I'm more of a well-wisher in that I wish him no specific harm. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's, what, that's, that's the, the depth of our, our relationship. <laughs> What are we talking about today, Ty? Well, 604, I guess, yeah. um, which Dan's name is on. So we're going to make act like he wrote the whole thing right? Mm-hmm. and make him answer for it when we uh, hit him with hard hitting questions about the choices he made as a writer. The choices I just made, yes. Yeah. They're all, yeah. you, you might not know this, but I, I make up all my lines on the spot. I like everything is improv. <laughs> I, I tell people that that like my thought, job as a writer is to follow Wes see, around and write down what he said. Yes, Wes yeah. actually can't read. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> Looking at the script, you see right through me. Yeah. I mean, you're from Georgia, so we assume. Watch it now. <laughs> I've watched the Bulldogs play. None of those right. guys can read. Right, right. Well, I know we didn't do a proper writers' room uh, this year, or you guys. Uh, I like to include myself yeah. in that. No, yeah. <laughs> we. I know you guys didn't do a proper writers' room, but. What is the process, and specifically for season six, when you guys sit down and say, this is what we're going to do, you're taking the book, and what did you go through in season six saying, these are the things we need to accomplish, and this is what needs to be in there? <laughs> what book? <laughs> <laughs> Who's Fred Johnson? <laughs> uh, well, this year was, I mean, it was kind of just because the sixth book has a closed ending, so it was really just kind of what are the stories we want to tell getting to that point because we kind of knew where, where we wanted to stop and also just weaving in strange dogs and telling that story at the same time. And uh, yeah, just giving all of our characters the ending that we all wanted or thought felt that they deserved, whether it be happy or not so happy. There was a process that happened because, of course, we came up with an idea for what the season could be. It's sort of a general document. Uh, but we did that without knowing what the episode order was. Then later... Um, the studio came to us, the heads of the studio came and said, hey, it, um, this is going to be a really expensive season. Is it possible to tell the story that you want to tell in six episodes? And so then we had to go back and sort of rehash through what we had come up with and Consolid- craft, yeah, consolidate craft some things version, and yeah. push things together, at least to get the, the emotional payoffs we wanted and stuff like that. Yep. So. Man, that's challenging because I remember when we were going into season six, um, we, cause we were shooting, we block shoot, but we were doing the first season and last, our first episode, mm-hmm. last episode first. Yeah. yeah. And I remember we got, uh, two scripts and then the last script and talk a little bit about like, do you guys have to go through and brainstorm and have the outlines and you'd basically write that last script ba- off of the outline? Yeah. I mean, basically like once we had everything kind of boarded out, like the outlines went pretty quickly and, uh. It was really just the last script, I guess, was a little bit more challenging because stuff you set up and just like callbacks and things you want to have happen, eh, maybe <laughs> like you're kind of working the wrong way right, in a sense. Right. So, but I think it, it turned out well enough. And uh, yeah, I just, I know with the block shooting, it made it a little more challenging, but uh, no, I think everything came together very nicely and that, and that we lucked out, but also we timed it that way and <laughs> worked at it really hard to get it to be where it was. Well, we also wrote in an unusual way yeah. this season. More than any other season, we just sort of collaborated on the writing of every episode. Uh, the, the room was much smaller. Um, we were down to four uh, producer level writers and uh, the four of us basically just chopped up every episode mm-hmm. and wrote, you know, I, I think Dan, um, you were responsible for most of the Marco stuff, the right? Marco, Pella, yeah. Philip stuff, yeah. Yeah, so so Dan wrote My almost My least favorite the, stuff of the, the whole season. <laughs> so the, the it was, stuff, it the was stuff a, that all of you fans are angry yeah, about. Yeah. Here's the guy. <laughs> and uh, Wes, we're like, we don't want to write for him, so they're like, damn it, who has to write for Wes? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the big, I think the big dramatic set piece in 4 is the raid on the station, right? Uh, yeah, the the supply depot. Yeah, yeah, that was you guys concocted that and just the whole idea of the spinning and mm-hmm. all of that and just like the the shootout and Joseph losing his his arm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, one of the more gruesome things we've ever done on the show. It was interesting because like coming off of three with the big battle between the Rossi and the Pella, at least from the Marco story, it was more of just a 
cool down episode and trying to recalibrate, especially with Philip's emotional arc leading towards the end of the season. This is kind of that episode three ended one part of his journey and episode four kind of picks up where we're going and he meets this new character named Tadeo. And uh, we find out like that he has a brother that he's worried about and things like that uh, back on series. And it's just Philip emotionally connecting with somebody else in a way that he really has never had or had to do before because he's always just been in his father's shadow. Well, the other thing in four um, is we really see Rosenfeld push back yeah. on Marco and, mm-hmm. and sort of establish herself as somebody who isn't just a yes man for the king. Um, talk about that. that we, we, we see, that we see, you, we right? see her raw ambition in it yeah. because, like, she's like, I want to be the governor of series, and we finally, after watching her, like, just this whole these first three episodes uh, with just how she deals with Philip, with kid gloves a little bit, and kind of knows her place. Here's where we kind of finally see her step into her own by disobeying some of Marco's orders, and even he's like that's insubordination <laughs> and she basically says well everybody who's like uh, it had an insubordination has been thrown out in airlockers dead and these are the things you actually need to hear and now that philip is not by your side anymore like these are the this is the medicine you do have to take and the things you do need to hear and he kind of respects her for being ballsy like that and says like yeah when we win this war you can be the governor of series no, no, medina medina has, sorry medina to be the crossroads medina yeah. medina the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. The, the crossroads the of the Medina. empire. Yeah, the funky, <laughs> funky cold Medina, yeah. Well, and, and I think that relationship, which this is like the, where she really uh, establishes herself as, I'm, I'm going to be your second command, mm-hmm. is this episode. But uh, there's, you know, you wrote that whole thing. You wrote from season, or episode one to episode six, you sort of crafted the whole Marco storyline. And it's full of cool moments. There, there's that moment where she, it's in an earlier episode where she, confronts him and he says, you know, most people don't speak to me like that. And she says, then you're welcome. Yeah. And she's just basically saying, yeah, you need this. You need somebody mm-hmm. who stands up to you. And that's that's very um, carefully crafted through those six episodes to create that arc for her and and the way she sort of pushes her way into the forefront. And we, we talked about this in the room that she senses the power vacuum. Mm-hmm. And she goes, oh, there's nobody here who can take this spot. I'm just going to take it. Especially with Philip. Yeah. I, he was supposed to be the second in command, but he's just fucking his way across the station <laughs> and he's fucking up and he doesn't have the tactical or like the, I guess the strategic sense that she has. So that's now she sees this as an opportunity now that he kind of went against his father's wishes and lashed emotionally lashed out at him. And now he's down and basically just fixing the ship with the rest of like well, the lower level people. Yeah. Talk about that though. Talk about the ways in which you crafted Philip's breakdown across the season. Is the the way that he's treating women now like stem from his a reflection of his you know his feeling of betrayal from his mother? I, I definitely think that's part of it. And the other thing was he was riding like, like he's a. I mean, emotions are going left and right, super confused. And but he's also being treated like a god at the beginning of this. So he's just kind of like, I can get any woman I want. I've been doing this, and he's just basically kind of like fucking his way, like fucking the pain away in a sense. Right. But you see that in the first episode with his friend where he like lashes out and he kills his friend who's basically kind of his partner in crime and just how does he deal with that? And then he, he's in the brig when we see him again and Marco is just like, I'll let you out. Like there's no, like Marco doesn't really care. Mm-hmm. Like, like he cares, but he's more focused on, and self-centered on himself than actually on the, the emotional toll like killing billions of people has taken on his son he just sees his son as an extension of him right and so he's just like oh whatever like if i can deal with this so can you yeah and so he's start he's trying to keep him close and you'll see as things go on but he also senses philip breaking away which is like what he did at the uh in the battle against the rossinante and yeah. stuff like that so it's just they have to me like they, they have the most interesting like just like the the, compl- the how complicated their relationship is his father son and the mother is out of the question mm. and the son chose the father at the end of last season mm. and now he's starting to i don't know i don't know, regret it but he's starting to question all the things and remember the things that his mother told him and now they're kind of coming to fruition he's yeah. seeing that with his father and how he starts to spiral out of control is so beautifully done i think coupled with what happened with naomi but also us being in this business we've all seen firsthand or had the experience of somebody that's gotten a lot of fame at a very mm. early age before they have a concrete sense of self and identity and that just contributes to the downfall to the to the spinning out of control oh yeah because like in in season five when he had that emotional breakthrough with naomi and then 
Marco comes in and just plays to his ego and rips that rug right out from under him. And it's like, you choose me and you can have all of this, the, like the world, the universe is yours. But if you go, if you like side with your mother, then you're just going to be weak and cowardly. And you like, you're not anything I ever wanted in a son. Mm. So yeah, mm. they're uh, fun, fun at the Inaro's house. Well, right. Christmas but, is but, great. You know, <laughs> Dan said, Dan said he found it the most interesting story. The great thing about the way we divided the season up this season is we really could let people take the storyline that they were most connected to. You know, normally you get you get a script assignment, you write that script. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it has to connect to all the other scripts and that's what the showrunner sort of guides everybody to make sure that that happens. But, but this season, it really was a matter of if you were just really in love with a specific storyline, Ryan right, would be like, okay, why don't you write that one? And very, from the very beginning, Dan was really into the Marco stuff, and mm -hmm. and even last season, yeah, uh, no, really I really engaged I, I, with the Marco. To me, stuff. the Marco stuff is just—I've never seen anything really like that on television. Like yeah. you never see the—you never really see a female character walk away from her family, yeah. and we understand why she did it. And you see this man who's just kind of just a, a maniac, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, just—but how controlling he can be of other people, and how yeah. manipulative he can yeah. be. And so, well, I mean, one of the things that's crafted really well in the Marco story that really makes it work is that he genuinely loves his son. Mm -hmm. There's true love underneath that. And what uh, Taya was saying in a previous episode is that it probably comes from a pure place. This, the, the beginning of the thing is him having a son and looking into his son's eyes and saying, I'm going to make this world a better place. And then through compromise after compromise through mm -hmm. and, and he has become what he is now. Yeah. And I like he loves his son. But he loves himself more. Yeah, like because there's like yeah. I, I think it was in season five. I I don't, I don't think the line or um, like he he wouldn't die for you, but he'd let you die for him. Mm -hmm. That kind of idea. Like Marco's mm -hmm. not going to take a bullet for his son, but he'll happily <laughs> yeah. put him in front to do it. Yeah. Right. It, what was the most challenging uh, for this season for you? What would you have to say was the most challenging? I, like just logistically not having a writer's room together like we did it all over zoom and uh just we were all separated because i think and i've talked to other writers about this how they felt in other virtual rooms and it's just when you're together especially if you really enjoy working with the people you do like things just spontaneity things just come and you just run with it and you go and you like you feel the energy and the creativity of just like this is awesome this is awesome and everybody kind of gets like a high off of it so it was trying to get that into what we were doing. It was because it felt like a little bit different. Everybody's, we can all see each other, but you just like that energy wasn't necessarily in the room this like as it was in previous seasons. So that was yeah. just the first challenge. The other, I think, challenge was just not having as many episodes. So just having to get everything we want to say and also make it feel like it's not just jammed in there and like, well, we got to talk about this. We got to talk about this. We got to talk about this. And so just having time to let things breathe, but also tell the story the way we want to tell it. Yeah. And how many, how many great story moments in the first five seasons came from somebody just jumping up and drawing on the board? Yeah. Somebody just jumps up and goes, well, what if, and they start just writing on the board or drawing on the board, the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, oh, I get it. I see what you're saying. And now you're trying to explain it with words. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not the same. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't have that same excitement. I, like I learned a lot about my process this year too, because what I found is that when if I'm around people that, especially the, very specific to the experience is that uh, I love the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. I love the crew. We've been together for eight years. But when I get on set, I need to feel that energy. Like I, I get the energy, the creative momentum. And when we're talking about a scene or we're doing a rehearsal and we're together, it just, that momentum really pulls me into it. When we were, iso we were isolated this season where we, they d discouraged us from hanging out off set. And then on set, you would have the crew go in, set up, get it ready. They would leave. Then we would go in, shoot. We would leave. They would come in. And then in between scenes, you're kind of away from each other. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel that connection. And that was the biggest challenge this season because I, I, I like to joke. I like to pull that energy in and bring it into the thing. And, and in a vacuum, it's really hard to kind of work yeah. to get to that place, that creative And place. also for us, I mean, a lot of the changes, like just being up there and producing the episodes, like just... Because Ty and I would just be at our desks facing each other up in the office and just spitball and come up with other things we could maybe change or make better. And we didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And also with talking with the actors as much, just because, yeah, of COVID and everything, it just kind of, it made everything be more rigid. Yeah. And everything's just like, yeah. we have to do this, then we have to do this. And yeah. so you lose a lot of that uh, 
the spontaneity. That, I think that's probably one of the things I miss the most is like not having you guys on set. I remember, I love, you know, when, when you're about to get a scene or whatever to, to talk to the writer because especially like you, you are so good at communicating like what this scene is about and what this yeah. is there. And then, and if you have this conversation, you're going back and forth. Also, um, your, your sense of humor will come across in, in what we're saying and like, oh, I get that. Oh, I see mm-hmm. how that's going to be. So not having the writer on set and you kind of have a question and it's like you don't have that interaction, that constant interaction. Yeah. And even just like talking with the actors on set, like, cause I, I, I jokingly say this, like the audience doesn't care what I write, they care what you say. Mm. So like if you have a better, if you have a better, like a more natural way of saying something that I'm like, yeah, go ahead, just like, like change that word or change that word. That just sounds more natural to your character and the way you do it and stuff like that. So that's just those kind of small little things like that just can help out and put things over the top. So what's, because uh, you came on The Expanse in season one, right? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've been here since the beginning. Yeah, it's yeah. been a fun ride. Uh, yeah. And what's that experience been like for you on a creative level and a personal level? Creatively, it's been amazing because I, I, I tell this story, but like um, the first uh, my first job I had before this was my first writing job. And it was a police procedural or a police cop show, like a dark one. And I was getting scripts to read for like, oh, what do I want to work on next? And I turned down a couple of things. But and then like this sci fi script came across and I'm like, I like sci-fi, I like some sci-fi, like I like aliens, I like Blade Runner, I like these more or alien, these more grounded things. I'm like, why are they sending me sci-fi? And so I read the script, and then by the end of it, I basically said, if they don't get me this fucking job, I'm gonna be so pissed off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, and then I went and bought the book and I started yeah. reading it, because it just, to me, this story, like, yes, it's science fiction, but it's so grounded in reality that it's, it's everything I like about science fiction, where you can have these allegories and tell these cool stories, and it's not just about, lasers and like traveling at super high speeds and exploring all these different alien planets. It was just people working in space. Like they, uh, the whole thing, the whole idea, like this is like truckers in space, like similar to that scene in Alien where they're just bitching about their contracts and yeah. stuff. It's just like normal everyday things. It just happens to be in space. Mm-hmm. And so that to me was really, really fascinating. And just taking on the science of everything and because I'm not the science person go to on that and be like, hey guys, I need something cool here. Just tell me, <laughs> tell me if this sounds real enough. And they're like, no, we'll fix it. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> but no, but like uh, the one thing it really did for me creatively is just wanting to tell bigger stories. Like yeah. a lot of the stuff I worked on was smaller, right. thing, but at the same time, you can also have these amazing characters. So I think the characters, especially the ones they created in the book and how we like whatever we did to make them uh, more adaptable for the screen. Like I just found some of the like the choices were so interesting, and the people. Uh, yeah, uh, like you don't have to sacrifice character because you have spectacle. Right. And so that's the one thing that I really kind of took out of this, and just trying to do things that I've never seen on TV. Right. Like I was talk- telling you guys about how when like my favorite storylines are the things that I had no idea like were like uh, were possible. Like Naomi not being able to live on a planet because of her bone density. The fact that you can bleed out in space without gravity. I'm like, let's make a whole episode about that. Or like like we did uh, when the stop happened in the slow zone. Like to me, those are the things that, yeah, like, I've never seen anything like that on television. I remember yeah. how happy you were when we were talking about that. And I said, well, somebody would be vacuuming up the blood. <laughs> like there would be a person whose job it is. There's blood floating yeah. around. There's a job. They just got a vacuum. They're vacuuming up blood. And I was like, that's cool. Like, like he so wanted that to be in yeah. one of the scenes. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. What's really interesting is that because we, we did this whole um, podcast, this whole show on Alien, the movie, and how, mm-hmm. how important it was to us. And one of the things that we both talk about, and even Thomas Jane talked about it, really struck us, was the common working man language yeah. in space. Yeah. And there was something about that that just gripped me and, 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 and gripped you and, and the people that see that. And I think that that's one of the things that, that The Expanse does well and that I, I really love and I really enjoy uh, seeing on there, and I think that when, for instance, when we pick up the Rossi crew, uh, how in the beginning of the season, and they're just exhausted and yeah. haggard, and you catch them in the middle of a war, the story is told on their faces of what they've been through and how long they've been through it, and living at that level, and uh, and you know, I, I remember early on uh, when we were first doing like the first season, second season. Sometimes you get directors on that aren't as familiar with the show. We don't get this anymore, but in the early days. And I remember 
<laughs> I remember some directors coming on and being like, okay, we, we need to, uh, we should have a, you should have a wrench in this scene. And they're like, well, logically, like he wouldn't be able to get in there. Well, can't yeah. we just beam it? It's the future. Just beam it over to his hand. Like just, and they were trying <laughs> to, to they hand. would try to do these sci-fi cheats yeah. that they've used to do in other shows. Yeah. And we're like, well, no, that's not this show. That's part of the, the, the attraction to the show is that how real it is. Yeah. And the things I, like, like I was saying, like, I want to do stuff I've never seen before. And so like we've done like just using the science stuff, like showing ships decelerating and flipping and burning. And what did someone write about like the pilot episode, which like the biggest moment was when the Canterbury like like basically just stopped. Yeah, no, and no, it, no, it, it, it yeah. turned around. The most exciting sequence <laughs> yeah. in the pilot is where I, a ship turns around and slows down. Yes. The, the, the like, flip and burn? The flip yeah. and burn. Yeah. Because yeah, 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 like, yeah. yeah. it's this big dramatic thing and the yeah. ship is falling apart. And, it, and all they're doing is turning around and slowing down. Yeah. We're going that way now. <laughs> Do you remember, you remember we went to Blue Origin and we showed a clip from the, the whole show and everything. We're sitting there from all these you know brilliant yeah. engineers and physicists. And all the, the only clip we showed was the Rossi landing on, on, Ellis. on yeah. Ellis. And they were like, Wah! And like cheering yeah. and like pumping. And it's like, that's exciting to be a part that's of something like that. because those guys spend a lot of time about thinking about how to make a rocket land. Right, That's right. like a huge part of their job. And so it's very exciting <laughs> that anyone cares. Did you work with like how, in terms to get that landing so accurate? Yeah. No, we just made it up. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're TV writers. We just make shit up. But even like the, the accuracy of the little details, I always, I, I was telling, uh, like this is always one of the stories I like where when we were shooting season four on Illis and we were at the bar and uh, the props people had like, they were pouring what like looked like whiskey, like Jack Daniels yeah. or something and it had color. And you're like, no, 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 no. Do you see any barrels around here to age that? And I'm like, <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> like, I never thought about that. I never like, would have so caught everybody that. Everybody has to be, yeah, like, yeah. So it has to be clear. And I'm like, that's a really good catch, man. And I'm like, <laughs> that makes so much sense. I mean, yes, obviously the uh, the brown liquid looks a lot cooler, but no, that's completely correct. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's not a lot, not a lot of wood barrels. Yeah. Like Ellis. <laughs> and it's funny that you bring that up because there's a lot of stuff in that scene that was me jawing back and forth with the prop department um because and and you you know you were on the same we were on the same team on that they should be clear all the shot glasses should it should not match yeah it's not like they brought a set yeah <laughs> that's like here's the ones we found in our stuff so they all they're all mismatched spring break 87 and they're like and we in the writers room we were talking about like how is Amos spring paying, break right <laughs> Like, what is, you know, somebody's got their, like, Chicago Bears shot yeah. glass. Uh, we were also talking about, like, Senior how Fox. is Amos paying for these? And yeah. I was like, you know what they don't have? They don't have bullets. You run out of those. Yeah. So, like, Amos, they're paying with bullets. And Dan was like, where is he getting the bullets? I'm like, he's making them on the ship. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that led to the line where he's like, I can make as many bullets as I want on a ship. I'm rich here. Yeah. Like, I can buy, yeah. like, everything. I mean, look, the, the expanses can be intimidating in that way, but what you do is what you do best. You know story, you know character, you know, and you, you focus on that and you do that, and then you have them come through and do a science pass. <laughs> no, totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, uh, one, of the, one of my favorite sequences we did uh, was just the Naomi trying to, after she was stranded on the, uh, the Chetsamoka, just that, like... Ty and I would just like, we were like coming up with, cause it's, it's different in the book cause you can hear her interior monologue, but in us storytelling, we're like, we don't want her talking to herself. We don't want, like, how do we tell this story visually of just like, oh my God, this place is gonna blow up. I'm running out of air. How, like, like I, I've solved this one problem, something else went wrong and just keep trying to ratchet up the tension. Dom did such a great performance, but just that, that visual storytelling from that episode, just like crafting that, that was one of my favorite things to do. It was so much fun. Some of those sequences, the ones he's talking about, where our two desks are facing each other yeah. in the EP's office, and Dan would be going, "What can she be doing between the halls that she has to do over and over again to do the and like and not just making up some bullshit thing of like she has to like balance the quantum? Um, it's yeah. actual things like she needs wires. Yeah, but she has to wire some shit together, and so she has to go between the halls and get wires and actually coming up with things that are real rather mm. than just." making up some, yeah. you know, and, like sci-fi And, and then having the helmet where she's trying to broadcast the message out so we understand exactly, like, yeah. in her SLS message, we, the audience, know, like, oh, this is what's going on on this ship, and then it eventually fails, and so she has to keep trying to do new things and do other things, yeah. You know, what's interesting about The Expanse is that it, in, in such a uh, well, well-written, complicated, interesting show with all these great characters, there's no pure evil, there's no pure good, yeah. there's all these in-between, but the elements are the antagonist a lot. You know, being just surviving in space 
is the challenge and it can be thrilling. I mean, that yeah. the one you're talking about with Naomi, I mean, that is like one of my favorite episodes and, and her just having to outsmart the elements and how to figure out how to survive is just incredible. I actually said that yesterday in an interview when they were asking about, you know, who the enemies and who the bad guys are, who the villains are. And I said that the, the biggest killer in the show is space. Mm -hmm. Space is merciless, man. It doesn't care about you at all. It will just murder the shit out of you. And it's not evil. It's just, it's the environment in which you exist. And trying to, and, and the sequences he's talking about is the writers trying to use that, the horrifying coldness and, and uh, inhospitability of space mm -hmm. to be one of the characters on the show. And just how, how dark it is too. <laughs> <It's> like, just, <laughs> how we were just trying to get light and stuff and like how to do that naturally and stuff yeah. like that. Cause, and just showing how vast it is. Like, like some of the sequences we do is like out at the ring and stuff. The ships are like this big on screen, but then they're massive mm -hmm. when you see them up close. Like yeah. that kind of just showing how big space is and how small we are. Mm -hmm. When you like getting into this, did you ever picture, did you ever think that you'd be working on a science fiction show like this? I mean, like when, no. when you started off? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah, like I started off with like crime stuff and murder stuff. So like this was just a great way to do something awesome that really intrigued me. And I feel like so lucky to be on this show for all these years. It's been yeah. such a great experience of just, like I said, doing cool shit, but also like having these deep characters with these like amazing emotional arcs and turns. Yeah. You know, we we talk about process a lot on this on this show, and it's one of the things that we're interested in. But it's it really kind of reveals, and and you've experienced that a good story is a good story, and yeah. the genre is the, the the decoration on top of that great story. But it really comes down to character and what the story is about, and 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 how that goes. And so, you know, you being able to have that lifeblood of what the story is, and then you just kind of lay the science fiction on top. of Yeah, it. and to me, that's that's the best way to put it of like how I fit into the show because I always. Like, to me, the characters are by far the most important thing. Like the science, I think, is what gives it, like the sh it makes the show what the show is, but that baseline of just characters. And because I always say, especially when you guys are talking about like good and evil, like I don't need to sympathize with characters or like think that person's likable. I just need to think they're interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Th those are the shows that I like to watch where you don't have to be a good guy or a bad guy necessarily, but just be interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, and we talk in, in the room, this is a question that comes up a lot is, do we understand why they're doing what they're doing? Yeah. And I think that's part of making somebody interesting is understanding, like he's doing something I would never do and I completely get why he's doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marco is a great example. That's of that. what I was just going to say. Marco, like I completely understand why Marco is doing what he's doing. I mean, he's not taking the right measures, but he's, I, I completely get his character in that sense. Yeah. So you're saying you would sling rocks at Earth if you were in this situation? I'm Team Marco. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think he's misunderstood. He's, he's the real hero of the show. You guys don't get it. <laughs> if Marco got what he wanted all the way across the board, what would the solar system look like? I don't know because he would be unhappy because Marco, I don't think he'll ever be happy. Up until season six, he was he knew exactly what he wanted. He knew each step. He was in control. And then as soon as he gets what he wants, mm -hmm. seemingly, then he, that's when his downfall starts. Yeah. That's when the cracks start to Because he starts getting bored at the beginning. He doesn't want to hear about like water rations and like having to govern and all these small minute details. He wants to go blow some shit up and yeah. throw some rocks and like pick throw fights some rocks. and pick fights. And yeah. that's like, so when he does leave series, he's like reinvigorated. He's, he's uh, yeah, he's re-energized. Yeah. About like, now I get to go do what I really like to do. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for hanging out. That was episode four, season six. That's our good friend Dan Nowak, Ty Frank. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.